Right, I'm here for another episode of Thor Inquiry, my interview series here on my side channel, and I'm joined by Peter Milligan, who is a veteran comic book writer. Obviously, we're going to talk about some of his primary works in this particular episode. Right, Peter, I thought one place we could start in this interview, because my style is I like to just talk like around topics and then see what how interested people are in that specific area. I thought we'd just talk about some of the big properties you've worked on and then see which ideas and themes connect to them. So a classic one is obviously a lot of people associate with you. One of your best books is obviously The, en the Enigma this is one of the best ones anyone, it's obviously highly touted from the Vertigo class, etc. One thing I just want to start with is just an icebreaker is, is that something that, I, I understand people have pride in old work, but does it ever annoy you if people almost make it sound like that was your best book or something? Because it was so young in your career, you know, Do you, does that ever annoy you? Do you want people to see it as just a preliminary work? Oh, I know what you want. By the way, I prefer legendary rather than veteran. Fair enough. Okay. Mm. Uh, no, I mean, you know what? It's something like uh, Enigma, because it kind of meant so much to me, and I know that uh, it meant a lot. Of, it meant a lot to other people. Um, I'm very happy if people say this is fantastic. I mean, my best work. I don't know. You always want to think that your best work is to come. Sure. Also, the kind of the work I'm mo most interested in tends to be the stuff I'm doing right now, uh, and I think that's how you try. Uh, that's how you try to have a career and that's how you try to write that you try to write what you're interested in yes at that moment so uh enigma for that moment i think was a, was it was amazing to work on and it kind of meant a lot to me i uh, drew from a lot of things that were going on around me and i know that it meant a lot to a lot of people and what's so good about something like enigma which has a kind of longevity you know, like a, recently, um, Dark Horse put out a really excellent um, uh, re-edition, new edition, and uh, it was kind of like the way uh, the way Enigma always should have looked. It, it was a fantastic paper. It was a lovely, it was a lovely book. It was a lovely sure. bit of stuff. You know, it almost then seems to it almost then seems to have a a brush of air again. It almost seems to be like a new book again, and it was. It was translated into German by, it was published in Germany as well. It was translated into German by a friend of mine. And so I could, we discussed it, we discussed the German translations and uh, I, you know, I read it in German. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, you know, so it's all, it seems to come alive again. So Enigma is a particular book because it's so personal, because it was mine, because it wasn't me taking over, uh, I don't know, Batman or. Sure. Someone. It was everything in there was came from came from me uh, and from what was around me, uh, and so that was. I've gone off answering your question. It's all good. It's all good. If I think something's good in the past, I'm happy to other for other people to talk about that because it's you know I mean like what you're doing at this very moment might be might be the most important thing to you, and it is for me. Uh, but you know, if you then kind of look back and look at your career in 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 some kind of more macro kind of way, you know, you have kind of a highlights of, of a career, and I think that's one of the highlights. One thing I want to ask, you said yourself there, it's a very personal story. I actually think one of the reasons it has kind of that cult following is it isn't just a superhero story or a comic. Like, I think a lot of people actually have a deep connection to, without, obviously, I'm not going to give any spoilers here because I, I think it's something, it's a criminal to spoil a book like that. But basically, the themes in it are very much about like the in, an individual's identity, how they see themselves. So what I wanted to ask you was this. You said yourself there, it was something personal to you and people around you. I wondered about that. Like, a lot of people could see that and ask, is this all about biographical or is this someone you knew who had again without giving spoilers something about their identity like that they'd discovered what would you say to that how would you able such a young man to write something like that well um i i had an editor who was going through what watched go through a period of uh coming out and it was kind of quite quite beautiful really um i mean and what was interesting this guy um he was a really close friend. He remains really close, one of my closest friends. But, uh, you know, when I first met him, I just assumed he was gay. And I just thought he was gay. And, uh, and he kind of... Denying it is too strong a word, because he was going through his own journey. 
but he wasn't ready to um, fully accept himself. And so uh, part of our the book was inspired by watching this uh, friend go on a, on a journey of of a journey of being able to embrace who he really was. And I think that's what the book's about. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the main character goes on a journey when he, when he embraces and he accepts and he uh, sees the, the, the beauty in the fact that he was gay. Um, but, it, but it's not just about being gay. It's about, the book's about it looks about finding out who you really are and looking into the past and, and working out what that means and what what kind of person you are and where you're going and being uh, if you're like brave enough to go on a particularly difficult journey to find the person you can be. And I think, uh, so, yeah, it was personal because he was around me. I saw his friend and, uh, and in fact, when he um, when I was writing the book, and obviously he was the editor of the book, um, he would then take me out to some places in Los Angeles to some gay bars. I'm not gay, um, so he take me out to some gay bars, and that was really uh, useful to get to tap into what the character in the um, in the story in in a in a in Enigma was would be feeling as someone who. Had always considered themselves straight, was suddenly in this position where things had turned around, and um, and, and if you like, he was being objectified. He'd never really come to experience that before. So a lot of our the story was really drawn from that. And then you have all the superheroes. Yes, you know, comic book. I've written some superheroes. I've written Shape of Change Event, which is a kind of offbeat superhero book, and I've written some other kind of offbeat superhero kind of stuff. So I then what I wanted to I wanted to embrace what comic books could do, and for a lot of people, what comic books are are superheroes. But the superheroes in uh, Enigma, I mean, unlike the superheroes, uh, sure, uh, unlike the superheroes you're going to find in the Abbey's Marvel comic. Uh, but you know the main character in the book is called Enigma. It's based on there was a, there was a in this guy, without going to, going too far into the story, the guy who who uh. When he was a kid, his favorite comic was a comic called Enigma, and there was this there was this character called Enigma, you know. And uh, it's almost like there was this first inkling. I think his feelings for Enigma were some proto erotic. Or oh, least, okay, right. That was or, the allure, right? Yeah, at least some kind of romantic or, or kind of like pre pre erotic feelings towards this uh, to this. This character who was quite beautiful, as well as mysterious. Sure. So yeah, so that went. So it was through, through or not first of all, and all around that time, I was in Los Angeles a bit at that time, and there seemed to be. It was just, I mean, the AIDS thing was still quite big, or you know, it's kind of. Uh, so all the stuff was around, and it just it all seemed to make sense. Right. One of the things I've noticed is if people think of some of the big topics of and the big um, themes and properties you worked on, it seems like the theme of identity and the protagonist's identity is a central aspect. Like the human target's basically all about that. It's like the idea of like, once you fake it till you make it, you do kind of become that individual. Obviously people will, I think a lot of people love the ecstatics work for that idea of it's about like, who are you? What's your perception of the world? Is this a big topic to Peter Milligan personally? Is it something you think about or ruminate a lot on? In my work, I explore and Yeah. Well, I think it's, I think it's a subject which, which affects us all, and I think it's 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 interesting that identity now has become one of the keystone themes of our age. I think. Yes, trying to everyone's all the signature dishes, if you like, of our age, and uh, everyone's trying to work out who am I. Like you know that that old question, what the fuck am I? What's going on? You know, yes. like, uh, I think uh, comic books are amazing a uh, way of of exploring that. In, it's, it's it's in it's in comic books DNA the whole idea of identity, you know, like uh, uh, the uh, the early kind of big hit in uh, superheroes were. That's all about, if you like, identity. Sure. These, these people who these kind of like these 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 uh, these uh, characters who put on this costume they became someone else, uh, but but by putting on the costume we weren't just 
becoming, you weren't just having a secret identity, you also, if you like, releasing another poss possibility of who you could be. And obviously it was interesting, a lot of these early comics were written by immigrants, by people who were perhaps... Yes. By people who were perhaps saw themselves as not quite American or, or at least felt that other people saw themselves as not quite America, American. And, and but by putting on this suit or by putting on this kind of like secret identity, they could, if you like, turn into an American hero. I always thought that was very telling, the kind of people who were creating those early, um, creating those early superhero uh, characters. So I think, it, so the whole idea about identity, I think is written into the, it's written into comic books. Therefore, I think it's a really good medium to explore and stuff. Yes. I also feel like if you think of even some of the basic concepts in comics, like being able to put narration, having speech uh, thought bubbles where people think something, I've often thought that's an element of the medium of comics that people ignore. Like in a movie, you can try doing a narration or someone's in a dialogue, but it doesn't tend to come off as well. Like in a comic, like I think Ecstatics is a great example of this. It's a perfect way of being able to show the inner world and what we're seeing in the story, right? Yeah, everything. You can get a narration, you can get a third person narration, you can get in a few, you got, you know, I mean, I think that was, that's what is so good about comic books as a medium. You can have prose. You, you can have, yes. you know, you can have words that mean things. And then you can have, then you've got this, then you've got this artwork. And then you've got, you know, so, so much, so much to play off of. And I think that's why comic books are, comic books are an amazing uh, medium to kind of explore stuff, explore particularly stuff that I'm interested in, which tends to be perhaps a bit more, complex than the average sort of uh, comic book. Uh, but, you know, I think comics are an amazing uh, way of, of exploring that. I mean, I often think that, even though a lot of people seem to think that, you know, when a, when a comic book is turned into a TV show or turned into, uh, turned into a, a film or a film, uh, you know, people often think there's somehow kind of a, a step up. Or yes. the comic, the comic books were kind of feed it club for films if you take away the money and the fame and the and the rest of the of say a film comic books are for telling often they're telling the stories that comic books are telling you're often a better neat way of doing yes. and you know say so you take away the money and that's and the rest of the test and everything else and all that stuff which is great but if you take all that away if you just look at the mediums as they are i think that for some stories comic books are just the best. I think that the horror, I think that our films are very good, uh, and TV is very good. And I don't think horror works amazingly well in comic books for a number of technical reasons. But, um, yep, I think comic books are, can be an amazing medium. I think that the drawback of comic books is the expectations we have of what they should be doing. Yes. All right, one thing I want to ask about is specifically with the series Ecstatics x -Pos, is one thing I feel like you really nailed in this series was it actually reminds me a little bit of what comics, again, to draw back to the old days used to be, which is comics were for people who were outsiders and nerds and weren't part of like, they weren't the sort of macho kid and they were the little bookish guy with glasses. I feel like this almost like re-energized um, that kind of a vibe because to me, what made this series really interesting was the sense of like, it's, on the one hand, these people are celebrities, but they're also sort of alienated, both from culture, from themselves. From uh, They're also struggling with their identities. Who are they? What do these powers mean? I thought you actually really captured that well. Do people relate to it in, on, on a personal level, that series? Feels like they must do, right? I think so. I mean, I think it was, it's also obviously uh, the stories about fame and the stories. And I think it was quite prescient in that, you know, we read the whole thing now where people are, Perhaps it was always the case that people were famous for being famous, but it seems that now more than ever, and, and uh, I mean, I kind of like some sort of on television, this, and I see that there's, there's a show where a number of celebrities go on go on a pilgrimage or something. Sure. Like uh, well, are these pet pilgrimages? Are, so are these celebrities? I've never heard of them. I've never seen what these celebrities do. And it really is their celebrities. They're famous for being famous. They're famous because they were on another show where it's about becoming celebrities. They don't, you're not a celebrity for, because you've got any particular, yes, any particular ability to do something or you've achieved anything. And, and 
my guys in um, our guys in ecstatics, they were pretty much like that, really. They were kind of all their superpowers were most of them were pretty rabbits, really. And um, and I think that they weren't they weren't really they weren't really great superheroes. If you like to be, you know, if you adjust them with the Avengers, because a lot of their powers are pretty rubbish. <laughs> yes, yes. People, like problems, they they drink too much, or they've got uh, you know, they be OCD, or they, you know, they've got other kind of issues, or they're Mister Sensitive. I mean, you know, you can kind of blow on him, and he's kind of in terrible pain. So they're all kind of pretty rubbish. <laughs> sure. But but they're way, but they're really really good at being superstars. Yes. That's and that's their main plot. Their main power really is to be famous. By the way, one thing I want to ask about specifically with that series as well, as you say, obviously another part of the gimmick is like they're kind of rubbish superheroes. Like these aren't the powers you'd choose in the X-Men universe, you know, like some of these are pretty underpowered. I want to ask that actually. It seems like a lot of your superhero work, you seem to like to pick people where it's not as obvious what you should do with their powers. Like maybe there's some weird use or maybe their power isn't even that good and they have to sort of come up with some creative angle to it. Are you just drawn to characters like that? Do you find the other, are the overpowered superheroes too much? Yeah, of course, because I think that brings out the humanity of the of the, of right. the You know, like if it's just yeah, because otherwise, also I think if the superpower if, if the superpower, but I don't want to talk about superpowers too much because I'm no expert. But fair enough. Me that if the superpower is too massive, then you lose sight of the person with that superpower, and they just become an extension of that superpower. You know, things that yeah. Having something whereby you know it's a bit rubbish, like in, like as in, um, as in the ecstatics, but also even the shade the change man, he had the power of madness. I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> True. I mean, I mean, it's, he, he he caused himself as much problem. As yes. Well, so it was a fairly kind of unwieldy kind of like unwieldy sort of superpower to have, and it was it's it's a moot point whether or not it is a superpower or. Yes. Um, Infliction or affliction. What has it been like? What, can you give me some thoughts on the actually returning to the series and doing the excellent and bringing it back and even have the same artists, etc.? Like, was it something you always wanted to do? Only if I had the right story, right? Because so I think that because uh, I think that things have changed from uh, since the I don't know ten fifteen years since I since I wrote Static. Stuff is a bit different, and I wanted to explore. The way that the world is now different, the way that, if you like, the world mediates fame and celebrity and all that stuff and, and how it's different now. And so I wanted, like, the, 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 the excellent to, if you like, represent this new way of doing stuff, represent this new way of uh, doing celebrity or doing fame or, or that, you know, so that they have, like, followers, they have doxing, they have. All this kind of the modern way right. of kind of, and the ecstatics are kind of quite the old fashioned. Like they make they, they they make videos. They want to make their TV show, and they were so it's quite like it. So it's old school versus new school. Or right, like, new fame. Or how you do celebrity. So you know. So I thought, oh, this is a good idea for a, a way to energize the book and and to come back and do a story that, that I want to write. Because otherwise, what's the point? To bring it back to when I opened with the question about Enigma and like, does it ever bother you when people like point to that as like the high point? Because obviously, like you say, you want to think that the things you're working on now are very important and things that mean something. Along similar lines, if I ask about Shade the Changing Man, right? I get the vibe, Peter. This must actually be one of those, like like a slight sore spot, because if people don't know, this is a series that to this day is not all in trade paperback. You essentially have to go and hunt out the old issues or buy them from someone or get them online. And essentially... There was a lot of series like this about 10 years ago. People might know, like, there was like Flex Mentalo for it, um, at Grant Morrison. There was obviously Miracle Man for Alan Moore. But a lot of those series have now been published. They're all out now. You can sort of, now, now those, the mistakes have been corrected, as it were. Does it bother you that essentially, I'm sure people still endlessly ask about, will it ever be published? And now with the vibe is maybe it won't be. This this was supposed to be one of your major pieces of work, right? Yeah, I've got a lot of questions about that. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't lie awake. I don't lie awake, uh, Nash my teeth. Right. It's it's odd. Well, I don't think it's I don't think it's um malevolent or malign conspiracy against it or me. Probably. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
uh, you know, I think it's just an, an oversight. And now they, I, I guess they think that it's moved on and, and the kind of impetus to buy shares of change management has probably moved on. But there are a lot of people who, I mean, I, it, is, it is a common refrain. refrain sure. Uh, they, my kind of, in some way, I used to think that's a bit of a, a bugger, really, that they can't just boot all out together because that was so good. And it would be good. Yeah. You know, something quite, something quite real about people having to scrabble around, as you said, to get those single copies. And then those single copies, you know, often I wrote them as single comic books. I didn't write them with trade paperbacks in mind. Those single comic books, those single episodes, then take on maybe more importance uh, and is a closer representation of how I wrote it and how I originally thought about it. Uh, so, yeah, so I think uh, be nice if they bring it out, but it's kind of nice that it was done as well. One thing, I, I, as you said there, I think you also nailed it. I think there is this weird vibe of like, oh, you know, like that was of its time and we don't need to bring it out again. So one thing I wanted to ask was this. I, if that's the case, I feel like some of that is just 90s aesthetics or whatever, because the funny thing is, if you actually were to write down the premise of this character, mate, this feels like it could be cast today. People love shit about serial killers and possession, a strong female character. And that's all the hallmarks of something you could make on Netflix or something now, doesn't it? That opening, that opening story, I think, like at the, the guess who's coming for dinner kind of story, yes. where Kathy goes back and she's got a, a, a African American boyfriend, and and and, uh, and she comes back uh, to home just as a serial killer, what I think was kind of killing her family. I think it is, and uh, and there's news that there's been a murder, and the cops turn up, and of course the cops immediately take a shot at this black guy. And I think that I mean that's. Just torn out of today's news. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah. And so, yeah. So, uh, and I think that that is a real example of, uh, I think there's a lot of stories. There's, a story, there's some stories in our State of Change Man about homelessness, about, you know, about it's, it still feels common. But I think that if you write a story that, that gets to the heart of matter, I think often those stories do remain, do remain current and do remain valid and, you know james joyce said uh, in the particular lies the universal also that was just an amazing thing to say that uh, if you kind of if you really got something if you get something so kind of precise that that it's you can you get it spot on uh it 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 assumes universal universal meaning and universal meaning tends to last yes by the way, just as a uh, one last thing on the shared topic, which is this, I, I know obviously you did like with the excellent, you got to explore the character again because you did the Justice League dark stuff and brought him back a little bit. So have you kind of put it to bed? Is that a character that lives in your head at all? Is it one of the more mainstay ones for you? Uh, I don't have to put it to bed. I mean, uh, there'd have to be a number of things would have to happen for me to write another episode. I mean, the, the biggest thing was, DC would have to want, want me to. <laughs> sure. But also, I'd have to, as I said with uh, 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 Ecstatics, I'd have to feel there was a real comp a compelling reason for me to want to write it. You know, I wouldn't want to, I mean, because it means so much to those. I mean, it was just great times for me writing that stuff, and I loved writing it, and it, it really, it was kind of like those characters really allowed me, it was all kind of broad canvas on which I could just kind of like explore so many things that interested me about America, really, because the story was about my my relationship to America. It was like a, you know, it was kind of like, like a lot of people are born and raised in this country. You have a particular kind of relationship to America because you get so much of its culture. And so much of it seems fantastic. But so much of it also seems horrific and kind of insane. And that hasn't changed. Uh, and so, like, it's... So and I kind of was going over to America quite a bit, and I don't know. So so a lot of that has a has a real kind of like has a real meaning for me, and a real kind of very important part of my life. And so I wouldn't want to kind of like piss all over it by writing a story just for the sake of writing a story. It would have to be something which I was really felt really urgently needed right writing. Right. 
One of my favorite things you wrote was your run on the human target. Because I think this is actually a great example of what I was saying earlier about like, I mean, it's not really a superpower. His ability obviously is just disguise himself. But the way that you used this, I thought was so creative because the thing that to me was interesting was essentially it was about the idea that when you take on an identity, to do it well, you actually sort of have to become that person and almost think the way they were, feel the way they And so it felt like it led to some really interesting areas because I, I would have assumed actually the initial premise would be, you're, you know, you're pretending. So it would be the opposite. The whole time you keep them at a distance. It seemed like you explored some really interesting ideas about how we change when we change who we think we are in our mind or something. And, the, and, the, and, and so then to go even further, so therefore what are we? So we feel we feel we're, we're this fixed version of ourselves. Yes. So maybe, maybe that's slightly more nebulous than we like to think. Maybe it's a slightly more fugitive than we than we um, than we kind of think. And that these that the what what and who we are is perhaps not quite as fixed as we like to think, and, and we do think. Um, so I, I, I remember a human target, the editor. So do you want to kind of write this thing between the target? Because all this stuff about identity obviously wasn't in the books. Um, it was it was, you know, it was a story about this assassin who took an uh, identity, but just to kill. It really was it, it was a it was a James Bondy kind of action kind of thing. Right. So, very good, but you know, uh, and um, and this editor said, here's here's some. I said, well, give me some of the human targets. Let me read them, and then I'll see if I want to write it. And, uh, I kind of read this stuff. I thought, I don't really, really, I don't really want to write this. It's not really my kind of thing. So I kind of sent him a, an email, uh, and I said, I don't really want to write a uh, human target. But then I said, but if I did write it, I'd do it like this. Uh, and then I then I went on to talk about you know using it as a using it as a way to talk about identity and as a way that you know how fixed are our our our, our ourselves really and how fluid. Are they and uh, and so I kind of in, in, in writing this kind of like letter, this dear John letter, saying I don't want to do this. I was saying, but if I did do it, it was almost like write, writing a breakup email. Saying, okay, <laughs> you have to break up, you know, because we're really not compatible. But if only we kind of did this, we'd really start to love each other, and uh, and and then you convince yourself that well, maybe there's something here, right? And, uh, that's why I did that. And I wrote that letter. The editor and he said, Well, it sounds like you want to do it, and, and this is really interesting stuff. So then I explored that, but it's only because I kind of thought, I don't really want to do that. But then, if I did, but if I did do it, this is how I do it, and and that, and so we then explored that. And so we talked about identity and just as a way of keeping the fun aspect of it, but just as a way of exploring this person, and also by remember, um. There's a really good book by Anthony Burgess on uh, William Shakespeare, and he talked about how to become everyone. He had to almost destroy his own. Ah, right. Okay. So, you know, it's right if you if you kind of read or look at a, a Shakespeare or look at a Shakespeare play. It's very hard to get an idea of Shakespeare. It's very hard to get an yes. idea of what he thought or what was his opinion on. Yes. Whatever you know, or, or Elizabeth, and then, and then, whatever, because he can, he, to become everyone, he became no one. Sort of yeah. removed himself from the story, as it were. Yeah, and also, yeah, that's right. Um, and I think that, uh, and in some ways, this what, uh, in some ways, this what the human target did. He kind of pushed him a chance to, he kind of, to become, to be able to become this person so accurately, kind of had to destroy himself. Kind of lost his own identity, right? You could say, yeah, it's interesting stuff, and, and I, I think that what's interesting is it's just as valid today. I mean, yes, I mean, as I said, I mean, like, as I said, uh, identity seems to be one of the catchphrases of uh, of today, isn't it? Like, who am I? What's the sexuality am I? What, what, who, what kind of person am I? It seems to me that I guess this always has been key, isn't it? Who and what am I? Uh, but it's uh, it's, it's a, very overt, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's, it's still it's still current. 
By the way, since you actually did name check Anthony Burgess there, believe it or not, I was looking up if there's any old media of Peter Milligan and I found an interview from 1988 where they actually, first of all, you're wearing shade. You look like an 80s guy, by the way. You've got like a jacket on, you've got the, the shades on indoors. And in this interview, they actually introduce you by saying you have been described as the Anthony Burgess of comics. Now, the reason this made me laugh, Peter, is I've actually always known you as someone. I only know you for your work. Like, I've never seen you as a media darling who's out there. So was there actually ever a time in the 80s were you ever caught up in that wave where you could have could have caught, done the Grant Morrison thing and tried to play up the media angle should you have done it would it have helped your career maybe maybe I could never be asked that much almost like I've never quite dreamed myself to do it every time right little bits of it you know Anthony Burgess was uh you know, amazing I think there was the deadline and I think uh Nate managed because they knew someone they managed to get in contact with uh uh to have an interview with, with Anthony Burgess, and I think I was the best red guy they knew. And the only kind of one they thought, oh, he might be able to have an intellectual, you know, he might, he might, I'm not going to say the smartest, but uh, I probably read more books in there, you know. Okay. And, you know, and it was, but it was a bad, it was a bad combination of, it was the first interview I'd ever given, and I really kind of like loved Anthony Burgess' stuff. So in some ways, it would have been better, even if it was my, third interview or if I thought it was a bit shit you know she so could be slightly more objective about it but right I, I remember we just had this long chat and I wasn't asking that many cogent uh, dip, uh questions I was just like really enjoying having a long chat with him and and he talked you know and he talked about his work and James Joyce and Shakespeare and and, and his war with Anthony with Graham Greene who he kind of really despised and uh, and also William Goldie, who he kind of despised as well. Uh, and it was just really funny to get that kind of insight into this kind of giant of British letters. Sure. I mean, I was talking about uh, William Goldie, you know, obviously Lord of Christ of the Austin, talked about William Goldie, and he said, oh, but he kind of made some comment about uh, why 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 he's kind of bigger than Anthony Burgess, partly because Anthony, uh, William Goldie's books a very good uh, set books for schools. Yes, yes. I said, yeah. He said, I said, you know, I said some of them he turned into really good films. He said, yeah, and almost like under under his breath, he kind of said, it's kind of what they could afford. <laughs> okay. And, and <laughs> yet, continue like literary battles with other lit literary giants. And I think who are slightly, I think he felt that he was better than them, and that because of four reasons. Which obviously is a, is a complex. Uh, Graham Greene and and uh, William Trevor were viewed as a kind of a as a higher level, and there was somebody. I think partly because of Graham Anthony Burgess bashed out so many novels, and he just wrote so much, and it was very hard to say what is what is ah an, right. I see. To say what what is an Anthony Burgess book? Uh, yeah. So uh, so anyway, it was a great experience meeting him, and. Uh, and I think he died quite soon afterwards. So, um, but yeah, I, I think it was probably a rubbish interview. <laughs> sure, it, it was fantastic. Uh, it was fantastic meeting. Let me ask you a similar question then, because I'll tie it to the joke you made at the beginning where you said you prefer legendary to veteran. Like, one of the problems you have is you are thought of as like a writer's writer. Like, you you get all your plaudits from the other great writers. But I'll give you the analogy, Peter. I also follow as a sport, like mixed martial arts, combat sports. And I can tell you in that field, one of the modern developments that people hate is that in the modern day, it's not about just being the best. You also have to be able to sell yourself. You have to be able to market and trash talk the opponent or have like a, an interesting element to your public persona it feels like in general you haven't really leaned into that aspect so do you ever have the same feeling that Anthony Burgess did like like I'm as good or better than some of these other names that maybe would be checked before me but you know I just don't have the hype essentially I, I know you've got to do a certain kind of thing to, to uh, uh, I think that I think I'm kind of I think I think some people I don't know I think the kind of comics are right it's almost like they're, they're just about comics, I think a lot of them, and the themes are just about comics. So I think perhaps I've got I have less of a interest in and deep knowledge of comic books. And I think that why I like I like my also I do my version of comics. Yes. So that's good. I write one look, I've a really good career and I continue to have a really good career, but, and uh, 
So I, I'm not kind of bitter or twisted about it. No, I mean, here's the thing. I see you totally what you mean. Like I can, I'll tie this to when you did the Animal Man run right after Grant Morrison, right? A lot of people in that scenario, if you're cynical, the angle should be you just amplify everything Grant Morrison did since everyone was loving it. Or like you say, if someone's just a, a historical comics nerd, you just do a classic character in a way fans like. To me, that was a great example of your style where, as you say, you even if it's someone else's property, you make it your own. Like I thought that was a very bold set of decisions you took on Animal Man. It was a pretty dark story you told. The only, you know, it's been really interesting what you said about um, uh, you have to make your own. You know, I've, I find that's that's the only way. It's the only way um, you can write one of those kind of like characters, uh, like you know, the particularly the big ones like Batman or X Men or whatever. You, you you try to make it your own. You try to write a story where where as much as possible, it feels like your own story, your own characters. Otherwise, it's really difficult. Otherwise, you obviously just keep something warm for another, the next writer. And I think so, even though, even though obviously, you know that Batman is Batman, or you know that this other, these other guys are, are kind of where you can't kind of like mess around them too much. You have to find some element in the story and in the character, maybe. Like John Constantine in, in Hellblade, so you have to kind of find some element in it that is just yours. And I think that's the only way you can do a decent job. And also, that's the only way you can do it and enjoy doing it, which is, I think, sometimes amounts to the same thing. Right. I, I, I want to get up in the morning and really look forward to what I want to write. Right, actually, since you referenced uh, Hellblazer there, I did have a question about that, which goes like this, Peter. It feels like everyone else who's British who ever wrote a comic already got to write Hellblazer. Like, why did it take you so long? I feel like you should have been in there in the 90s with everyone else, right? <laughs> I was doing other stuff, for one. I, I was never a huge... I don't know, what sort of Jamie was doing it. He did it for ages. A lot of your peers, right? He, yeah, he's, he's previous to me just a little bit. Oh, OK. You know, I, I think he came just a bit before me. Uh, but then, yeah, you know, but he was doing it for ages, and it's almost like it was his book. But then I was doing other stuff. And I think they eventually asked me to write a little mini series. So I wrote this little mini series, and they kind of immediately said, "Well, do you want to write the series?" And I hadn't—I'd never really thought about it. Oh, it wasn't a character you were sort of super drawn to or anything, or you always wanted to write? Interesting kind of character. Yeah. Uh, but I think that I thought what was interesting about and is interesting about John Constantine is how. Yeah. He feels like a real person because he's got a lot of different sides to his personality. You know, it seems like everyone that writes him kind of like does what they want with him and yeah. brings, out, brings out a slightly different aspect of uh, yes um, of, this, of this geezer. And it's and I think they're they're but 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 there's some kernel of a, of of a central John Constantine ness which remains. So I think that that's the kind of way in which, even though the peripheral, the peripheral stuff can change and, and, and the writer's particular interests can be explored, there's still some kind of quiddity, I think the word, you know, that kind of inner, the inner, yes, Constantine ness kind of remains. And I think that's why, that's what I think that's why people respond really well to it. I think that's why people like it. And I think that, I think it's, it's still kind of a pity that, there's not some kind of monthly job constant time book that we're coming yes. Um, one thing I've noticed in a lot of your interviews, you often name check as a heavy influence or an artist you enjoy, obviously Kafka's work, right? Now, I think if anyone knows even a little bit, they'll be able to see elements of it in things like Ecstatics, Human Target, Shared or something. Like that. Can you give me your sense? What is it about Kafka's uh, work that either speaks to you or maybe he's informed your own work? Well, it's really a... Well, Francis Kafka's influence on ecstatics. That's it's a really that's a really interesting uh, parallel. Uh, this kind of frothy bunch of Los Angeles celebrity wannabes compared to this <laughs> sure. black and white. Well, I mean, Kafka's just so brilliant. I think he's just so modern, and I think he kind of like he manages to he just manages to grasp that modern spirit of anxiety and despair, uh, but particularly anxiety. And I think that 
a bit of anxiety in work is good. And I think that characters that are anxious tend to be real, they tend to be real stuff about themselves. I think that uh, you know, the capitalist is, you know, his, his, his work is is dark and a bit miserable and 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 difficult to completely pin down. And I think that it has a, obviously has a kind of a quasi-religious quality to it. Uh, and I think probably deliberately, because I think he was probably quasi-religious. And, uh, and it's just so good. And I think that I, you know, I would, I started to respond to it when I was pretty young, and it stayed with me. The stories like *Metamorphosis*, it's, it's, it's a really interesting story. And I think it says so, so much about the human condition. And I think that the idea of *Metamorphosis*, I was always interested in, in like the family around, um, you know, around Gregor Samsov, the guy who turns into this giant bug kind of creature. Uh, uh, and I think this, in this, the family's really interested, really interested in the daughter or the sister, who, who is the person who, who is at the first is really, um, who's really kind of, he's the only one in the family who, if you like, shows him any sympathy or helps him. Uh, it was interesting that, yeah, you know, she's always going through her own metamorphosis. So the word metamorphosis is, you know, she's becoming more, she's becoming a woman and, and, you know, her body's changing. So I always thought that that was a fascinating story. And I just love the way the story opens. Uh, I mean, I paraphrase that, you know, after a night of, of, un, of, of troubled dreams, he wakes up to find a symptom into this giant monk, this giant bug. And it's like, all right, no explanation. No, <laughs> sure. Because he's been bitten, bitten by a bug uh, the other day. That's what it is. He's been turned into this giant bug. You're either with us or you're not. And they think, yeah, okay, I, I accept that. This is this, this this is how the story starts, and I love the way it's just bang. This is what it is. You either come with us, or you don't. I think it's terrific. Yes. One thing I've noticed, I mean, you've even kind of said it yourself in this interview. I noticed the theme also of your work. It seems like it's what um, it's what a lot of uh, writers seem to do. Is it seems like the areas just in your life that you're interested in, other topics, other artists, other th- ideas. You don't. They don't just bleed over. You intentionally bring them into your main work yourself as a way to like explore the ideas or to kind of push them through your prism, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I think you, you're in a you're in a really kind of like privileged position that you can have stuff which everyone thinks about it and everyone might have coming I mean, around inside their heads or or kind of like earworms or kind of conceptual earworms or stuff which might keep you awake at night thinking about. I mean, you're in a position where you can dig into that a little bit and not just to use it as a commercial means, uh, but as a way of exploring this stuff. And I think it's a really I think uh writing and creating and doing comics is a really interesting way of really interesting way of exploring the stuff that's that you've seen around you and, and that's and that's happening inside your head. So I think it's uh I think uh I think that's what's so good about it. I think that's what's so interesting about it. It is too interesting. As you said, you're not someone who's just so like uh, insane uh, aficionado of comics history and all the old characters and stuff. Is there a degree to which uh, part of this also is that that's one of the ways that you, essentially that's how you earn your living. You take a certain property, someone else's character, we want you to write this. Like you say, you do a pitch, here's how I would do it in my own way and bring my own elements. Like essentially, if 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 American comics, Peter, were like European comics, like the ones where they're considered supposedly a higher art form, the French comics and stuff like that, if it was supposed to be a thing where it didn't have to be superheroes, like you say, it could be any story within the medium of comics, would you be someone who didn't work that much for superheroes? Do you do it essentially because it's a necessity? We don't work for, I mean, actually, recently, in the last few years, all I've done is, is pitch small shorts, uh, miniseries, and I've worked for independence. Uh, and I think, um, and I think that's, I really enjoy it. I mean, it's, you know, in the, but often they're just kind of ideas I have to do with, to do with what's bugging me, to do with what, what I'm interested in, to do what I'm thinking about. And, and yeah, and just generating, generating uh, ideas and selling them. You know, that's, that's, what I, that's what I do. By the way, one artist that you worked with in your career that I'm quite interested in, just I just find him to be very enigmatic, is obviously Brendan McCarthy. And I, I always thought the hooligan haircut stuff you did was like, that's an example of a comic I can't believe would ever get made in the modern day, surely. What point? 
Hooligan's haircut from 2008. Hooligan's haircut was Jamie. Oh right, I see. Oh sorry, yes, I've got the I got them mixed up. Yeah, but anyway, they're both. By the way, they're both brilliant enigmatic artists. So yes, Jamie was he- Jamie was heavily influenced by Brendan. Ah um, right, I see. I've I've mixed the two in my head there. Yeah, he'd be first to say he was very influenced by Brendan McCarthy. Uh, and uh, yeah, because obviously he was a generation down. Sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, so he looked at haircut. A hooligan was that was the was a conflation of our two names of a Hulian Milligan, uh, hence hence the name. Yes. Right, well, uh, well, by the way, apologies to Jamie Hewlett. Then he obviously should be the one I referenced. But to bring it back, can you give me some thought? Who is Brendan McCarthy? He just seems like a very unique, mysterious guy. He would so love it to be called enigmatic and mysterious. He's not mysterious, is he? <laughs> okay. He's a really good artist. I think he's he goes his own way, and he's obviously. He's more than just an artist. He comes up with amazing ideas. He's kind of a, he's a, he's really, he's a real, he, he's a kind of a, he's a kind of unique kind of talent in that he's kind of the stuff he does. something think that where where we get stuff from and, and and how he kind of uh, and how that stuff comes out is quite unique to him. I think it's terrific. I think that obviously we did some really good work together. Do you have some sort of frequency the two you meet on? It seems like you vibe quite well in your work. Well, we did, we did have, yeah. But uh, I think that we kind of, I think we often talk about we will do something else together. That's to be the right thing. I think it's been for us, though, some of the stuff we did together in the past was was important to us. So it would have to be the right story and the right situation. And then say, for example, we wouldn't do a superhero, that it's some kind of, or some kind of job, you know, we wouldn't kind of do that. We'd have to wait until there was something which is what we felt was worthy of us coming together again. Yes. Well, we won't, because sometimes things move on, you know. By the way, one thing I did wonder, actually, is I notice a lot of people, because 2000 AD, mainly due to how the business works, but also it's a comic that obviously isn't the biggest names nowadays, it tends to be where people started with their work and then they went on to bigger things. I notice a lot of creators, it seems like they either don't talk about the 2000 AD year or they, maybe because they think they didn't get a good business deal or something. They they seem to almost dismiss it. They don't. They think it's like infantile. How do you look back on your period? Because not only Hugh Echo, like I think bad companies, just great fun if people want to go and check some out. How do you think of the 2000 AD stuff? Great. I think a lot of a lot of uh, British writers you know, cut their teeth on, on, on the on 2000 AD. But that's again that sounds that belittles it. I think they did a lot of people did some really good stuff. On yes. Yeah. There was some really good stuff and I mean I don't look at it quite you know I don't look at it every single kind of uh, month or anything now but I'm sure there's some really good stuff now that's coming out there. And so it's not just it's not just a feeder club for the Americans, uh, but I think this obviously does stuff to its own right. And the stuff I did for it, I don't know, of that time, I think I was really, I'm really happy about a lot of stuff. Uh, and uh, for who gets hair cut, particularly sooner or later, the thing I did with Brendan at the back of the the comic, I think that, that's, that stuff stands out. And Bad Company, I think, a lot of good stuff in Bad Company. I think that there was a uh, Brett and Inks by Jim McCarthy, Brenton's brother. I think the artwork was amazing. And I think a lot of that stuff was really good. Uh, so, you know, I still think that you shouldn't be little 2000 AD. I think that, you know, they've been going for a long time. I think any, any comment that goes for that, on for that long, you're going to, the quality is going to vary a little bit. Cause sometimes it's going to peak and sometimes it's going to trough a little bit. But overall, I think it's terrific. And I think that, you know, long may it last. Another person I saw that you name checked as an influence was uh, John Le Carre, the spy writer, the one who did obviously Tinker Tailor Soldier. Right, I saw obviously a, a property you were able to explore some of this on was when you did your version of The Prisoner, which was a quite a fun little romp. I thought, is have you? Would you like to do more in this vein? I know you've done some stuff with some spy stuff, but I feel like you could do a full on book, right? Interestingly enough, I'm actually just looking through uh, the spy book I'm into the cold at the moment. Uh, okay, my wife. Uh, Found an old copy of it in German. Um, uh, yeah, so she found uh, Der Spion der Aus der Kälte kam. Uh, this is spoiled things to be called. Uh, and, and said, so uh, I'm learning German at the moment. And uh, she said, uh, this might be interesting. So I kind of, some sort of battling to the German, but also then I've got the um, English one again. And it's just so terrific. You know, he's just a, 
it's more than just a uh, spy, uh, more than just a spy novel. And uh, yeah, but I don't. I mean, I'm not sure how that's really influencing is in terms of my work. I just think I think it's really great. Ah, right. Okay. What did you actually think of the prisoner project you did then? I thought it was an interesting approach. Yeah, I think it's fun. I think it was a fun little thing, you know. No, it was kind of like it was not. It was not a deep movie. It was a fun little thing, you know. Okay. By the way, one of the more modern um, works you've done, I wanted to ask about, is Britannia, the series you've done quite recently. Can you give me some, like, what what does this, as you said, at this point in your career, you could sort of choose some of the projects you do. You could do smaller ones. You could do independent stuff. Was the idea of this, you wanted it to be a full-on story? Like, like in the future, will you potentially do some more? Will this be like a six, seven trade type series? What, what do you mean? Uh, I didn't quite Would you like that. Britannia to expand out into a, a bigger story than it is now? Britannia will, uh, because partly because there's been now been a, since since my comics come out, there's now been a TV series called Britannia, set you know, set in the time of Rome, which is kind of stymied it a bit. Um, oh, I see, right. Yeah, but obviously the com- and my, our comic came out first. But no, I mean, look, as you know, like, you know, you didn't do it, and uh, if you like, Rome was all around us, you know, the remnants of the Roman Empire. For sure. And, um, and, um, so I was always aware of the world, and I'm also interested in the classical world, and but also kind of interested in the Celtic world of uh, like the pre-Roman Celtic world of this country of, of you know the Druids and that kind of stuff. And I was figured doing a story which, if you like, meshed these things would be really interesting, set in this country, uh, but with a character who was like our point of view character who had ideas about this world, which were perhaps a bit anachronistic, but, but um, which we could perhaps relate to. So we're obviously a detective. You know, so that was a detective story. So, yeah, uh, so I guess the John McCarry, he was the, it was a detective story, but it was obviously a difference because he was an ancient Roman. And yes. So, so, so what was I, was I was interested in there was, was just, you know, from, on the face, of, on, the, on, the, on the surface, a lot of their, a lot of their, world seems so modern, uh, the Roman world seems so modern and so contemporary. But obviously, scratch that surface and some of the kind of the ideas and some of the thoughts ancient. Yes. They were, you know, because they were ancient. By the way, without going into all the specifics of each case, how how in general does it work in your career? Like, do you actually have a say in who the artist is when you work with like a big company? Do you do you sort of talk to the artist first and say, "Would you want to do this book with me?" And then we pitch it together. Because like a classic example to me would be like, it's impossible to think of ecstatics without Mike Alred's art. Like that seems like almost like he's the perfect artist. But was it always an idea someone like that would be involved at the beginning? Do you get to have a say if they keep working on it? How does that work? Yeah, I think I think someone like ecstatic. If I remember right, uh, actually Alonso was was the kind of the, was the circus master. He was kind of like he was the guy uh, Marvel, I think. Then uh, uh, when we when we came back, I think kind of that was almost. I, th- I think like Mike was always kind of on board with that. All right. Other stories, more generally, like when I kind of they pitch an idea to. Yes. And then we're going to do it. Then kind of like, then you have the process of which artist should we have? And then often kind of like, we might, both Benjamin and Chamois, they might kind of say, this is the artist we want to write with, we want to work with. And well, I'll look through them and then, and then we'll kind of whittle them down and, and maybe then to have a couple that um, we both really like and both they would be really good. And then we'd reach out to the artist and see whether they're uh, free. So and that's how it tends to work. And then find an artist who is free and who really wants to do it. And then you, you might ask for a couple of you might ask for a couple of sketches, a couple of, you know, not not an interview. So it's just it's they can be good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, just some stuff to see whether they can really get the characters. You know, so that's the process really. You kind of the idea would come first. I mean, every now and again you might just be almost like write a story with someone in mind. I'm doing this thing at the moment. And I did have, we have someone in mind, and they even did a little drawing for the pitch. Uh, now we're just, uh, now we're going to do it, this story. I can't tell you it is yet, because it's not quite at this stage. Okay. It's a really good artist, fantastic artist. 
and they he's just not sort of they just not sort of work out a deal with his deal with it. But I think that that's but that's kind of a atypical when I kind of like really come up with the pitch with with an artist in mind. That is unusual. It's tough enough as it is, you know, having a further a further restriction saying no, I want to a story with it, which this artist will be able to draw. But I mean it's I kind of more focus on getting a good story for what's normal. Fair enough. One thing I want to ask was this. Often when I'm describing the medium of comics and I'm trying to explain to people kind of what you did earlier, but how it's different from a film or a book and you can do different things with it. One thing I often say, even though it's quite a glib way to phrase it, is the brilliant thing about comics is, in theory, if the artist's good enough, he can draw anything. It's not like a movie where you have to have the budget for the special effects. or. Th- but at the same time, I actually realise I'm being somewhat reductive about art in that sense. Like, I'm sure it's very difficult to draw some of the things these people are asked or if you give an idea of a, a, an image... How, is the image the same in their mind? So I wondered actually, how much do you, how much is that part of your process when you write the script? Like, do you try to give the artist somewhat carte blanche as to how he interprets it? Do you want to be a little bit more specific so he nails the vision? And that's it. What would you say to that aspect? I tend to write. Uh, it's interesting. I once, I once, uh, I was doing some work for. Um, I was going for some meetings with Hammer. You know, it's in the Hammer movie. Oh, oh right, okay. This is one of these producers, and um, they've never seen. Um, They've never, and I showed them one of my comics, they've never seen a comic book script before. So I thought, okay, then I'll show you a script and I'll show you this comic so you can see how one turned into another. And, and they thought that um, my comic book script was more like a shooting script. I, which I do, like every single shot, i.e. every single panel, I describe what's going on there. Uh, and so I write, I write a full script, everything's in there and the artist can look at it and you can read it and and, and see what's going on. It's, it's a bit like a, a movie school. And, uh, but um, a good artist, you know, obviously they're the artists. They might have a, if they, I'm very happy for the artist to change that as long as they've understood what I'm trying to get and they're working towards the same goal as me. Every, every now and again, you might get an artist to change his stuff just for the sake of it. Well, that's kind of really fucking annoying. Um, but like, you know, so if, if someone is them as a really good artist and they're the, they're the visual person and they have like a slightly better or more interesting way of achieving what I'm trying to achieve, that's fantastic. Like maybe at the end you can just say what your newest book is and we just leave it there. Yeah. Maybe at the end you can just say what your newest book is and we can leave on that note. What my, what my, my, What's oh. your newest piece of work coming out? The story. Okay, I'm doing a few books. I'm writing uh, one book. One story I'm writing for is for Vault Comics. It's called Deus, and it's set uh, kind of slightly in the future where the world. Guess what? It's in a world where the world's pretty messed up, where the environment's really <laughs> okay. You know, on the verge of war. I know it's impossible to imagine. Yeah? <laughs> sure. And, and then some people come up with a solution, and the story is about whether or not that solution is uh, worse than the problem. Yeah, just leave it on that, mate. I think I'll just cut it there. Yeah, it's all good. Here at Thor Inside, I have people on my side, both literally and metaphorically, because this video and all of the content on my channel is kindly supported by my Patreon community. Would you like to get teasers for my upcoming content and see who the next guests are for my interview series? Do you want to ask me a question in my monthly video AMA? Maybe you want to select between the topics I'm going to do for my next solo video, or perhaps you are excited by the idea of a private, exclusive, never-to-be-published personal discussion with yours truly well if so heed this call to action and join thor inside today via the patreon link in the description box below